Welcome to Better Than Ever Live, wherever you're watching or wherever you're listening. Hope you're making today your masterpiece. In this live show, we're going to talk about high intensity interval training. We're going to talk about what HIT training actually is, why maybe it's become so popular, and then we'll look at how effective it might be compared to what I call steady state cardiovascular exercise, sort of continuous interval or continuous intensity training in terms of things like weight loss and aerobic fitness, metabolic markers, things like uh, body fat, all of these kinds of things. We're going to talk about HIIT training versus continuous training and maybe what might be better. My name is Dr. David Geyer, double board certified orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist, and media medical expert. I help you feel and perform your best regardless of age, injury, or medical history. And as I say every single time, I'm going to say it for the rest of time on this live show, please understand I'm not giving you medical advice. This is meant for general information and educational purposes only, whether it's about HIIT training, whether it's about uh, steady state cardio, whether it's about the studies we're going to talk about. This is just for information and educational purposes only. Now, I'd love to hear your comments, your questions about any of this, whether it's the training, the, the benefits of the different types of training or the studies we talk about. Leave those in the chat the chat on those side. Please don't leave them in the comments. I mean, you're welcome to, but I am not going to be able to see these live. This came up in the Ask Dr. Geyer session on Friday. People were saying that they couldn't see or that I wasn't responding to their comments. I can't see your comments. The way that I can stream out to YouTube and to Facebook and to LinkedIn is through a service that I use called Restream. I get the chat from all of those, but I can't see the comments. So if you have comments, have questions, and I'd love it if you'd leave your first name and where you're located, which I just love to know where people are, leave those in the chat. If they're about the studies we're going to talk about, I'll sort of address those as we go. If it's about the HIIT training, steady state cardio, things like that, we'll talk about those at the end of the session. So that's sort of what we're looking for. And I also am curious if you're watching this, let me know what kind of exercise you like the best. I'll give you my thoughts on all this as well. But the first thing I want to talk about is poor sleep. I have talked about sleep a lot on this show. We've talked about ways to get better sleep. In fact, that was the first episode or the first live show I ever did was about ways to improve your sleep. But I've talked about how sleep affects us in all kinds of ways. It makes us eat more, it makes us put on more fat, all, all sorts of things uh, as it pertains to sleep. But I want to talk about a study today. It was published in the journal uh, Scientific Reports last week. It was a big study that showed that not getting good sleep triples your risk for heart disease. And when we say poor sleep, obviously one of the factors there would be how much sleep you get overall, the total numbers of uh, the total numbers of hours of sleep. But it's not just that, it's quality of sleep, it's difficulty falling asleep, it's being sleepy the next day. All of those seem to be factors in the risk of heart disease. This study, the researchers looked at over 7,000 adults that, and then the researchers looked at their sleep patterns, looked at uh, their history of heart disease. Some of the participants even wore heart monitors to help them figure out kind of what the sleep was. Now the question is, why does poor sleep affect your risk of heart disease? And it looks like one of the big factors may be that not getting good sleep is linked to the stiffness of the arteries in your body and around your heart. And this isn't the first study that's shown this. There was a study a few years ago that showed if you, this sort of a Goldilocks effect, effect. If you sleep more than eight hours or less than seven hours of sleep each night, you increase your risk of arterial stiffness that leads to heart disease or stroke. So again, if you sleep more than eight hours, less than seven hours, that puts you at higher risk of heart disease or stroke. So there's some kind of issue going on with poor sleep, not just in terms of the number of hours, but again, if you're not sleeping restfully, if you're, you know, maybe you have sleep apnea and you're not getting deep sleep, all, any kinds of factors like that, it seems to increase your risk of heart disease. So if you have issues sleeping, definitely work on that. That's something I've been working on all of 2022 and I'm starting to figure it out a little bit. Now I want to talk about a study that it got a lot of attention. I'm actually, uh, I'll be talking about it this week on TV, on the two TV stations. I'm the medical expert here or four here in uh, Charleston, but it got a lot of publicity. It was a study out of Oxford. It was published in the journal Frontiers in Nutrition. These researchers looked at 400,000 British adults looking at dietary factors and specifically vegetables and whether or not they were beneficial for heart health. 
And what they concluded is, there's sort of a two part to this. One, raw vegetables appear to benefit your heart according to them, but not cooked vegetables. What they figured out, and I don't really know I study a lot of, I read tons of medical research, and I'm a reviewer for three uh, orthopedic journals. So I'm good at evaluating research, but what I'm not real good at is these multifactorial analyses and how you account for one variable versus the other. I'm not a mathematician, or um, it's just really tricky. But they, what they did is they factored in other lifestyle factors alcohol, smoking, exercise, whether or not you eat fruit, how much red meat you eat, how much processed meat you eat, do you take vitamins, do you take minerals? And once they factored in for all of that, they argue that eating vegetables had no effect on your risk of heart disease and peripheral vascular disease. Again, taking all of those factors into account. Now, I will tell you that is not a good enough reason to not eat vegetables. One of the things that has become very clear with nutritional studies over the last decade is that one, any study, is, it's very difficult to say this one thing is either good or bad and plays this much of a role. The problem with nutritional studies is they're largely based on huge samples of the population. They're retrospective. They, they know the outcomes. All right, these are the people that got heart disease in this case. These are the people that didn't. Let's go back and look to see what they ate over the last 30 years. Well, one, people are notoriously awful at whether it's remembering what they ate or being honest about what they ate, that's really tricky to do. And again, it's not cause and effect, it's association. And there's so many variables that make those difficult. It's very hard to do a nutritional study, take saturated fat or red meat. All right, this group is gonna eat red meat two meals a day for the next 20 years, this group won't. That's not ethical, you, can't, you just can't do that. And so that's what makes nutritional studies really hard. But I will tell you that just because one multifactorial analysis is saying that vegetables weren't good, in this case for heart health, that you shouldn't eat them. One, that doesn't take into account other benefits of health the decreased risk of cancer, like colon cancer, and so many other benefits of vegetables. I'm, I'm just really skeptical of this. I think it got a little bit more attention than it probably should have. I wanna see those studies repeated. There are tons of studies that show benefits of vegetables. Now, the, the whole, does, did it account for other stuff? I, I don't know, but that's really tricky with nutritional studies. All right, last one I'm gonna do, because I don't wanna get off on a rant about vegetables. I am trying to add more vegetables in my diet, and broccoli is the one that I'm really into now. Uh, so uh, I'm not gonna discourage anybody else from eating vegetables. Last one I wanna talk about is sleeping next to a partner and does it affect your relationship and vice versa does your relationship affect affect your sleep when you're next to a partner this seems kind of stupid but it's sort of a chicken and egg thing we know that sleeping next to somebody gives you better sleep and we know that the better sleep you get improves the quality of your relationships but kind of where does it stand one versus the other and there's no real relationship up until now or no research that shows what effect your relationship has on your sleep. So there was a study of about 800 or so adults in Australia who had to do these surveys talking about their sleep and talking about their relationship status. And I know this sounds stupid, but it was in a real journal, the journal Sleep Science. And what they found out, people who have just casual or occasional partners and they sleep next to just some sort of casual person or they're single completely, took over 10 minutes longer to fall asleep than people who go to sleep and who live with a regular partner. Now you may say, all right, 10 minutes, who, the, who cares? It's not a big deal. But if you look at the sleep studies, the difference between people with insomnia and the difference between people who sleep normally, and we're talking about things like hyperarousal, increased uh, metabolic rate, higher body temperature, heart rate, more brain activity, that those changes are, are seen in as little as four to eight minutes difference in falling asleep. So 10 can be a significant difference. Now, you might ask, well, does it matter if you're male or female? Well, it does. Women are much more likely to be affected by relationship status than men. Men tend to fall asleep, according to this study, just as fast, whether it's somebody they live with, long-term relationship, or if it's just a casual partner. Feel free to comment your thoughts on that 
and whether or not you're surprised by that. But here's the good news, if there is any good news. This is a study of what we call sleep latency, the time it takes to fall asleep. You turn off the light, you try to go to sleep. Longer if you're single, longer if you're just sleeping next to some sort of casual person and not somebody you're in a long-term relationship with. But the total amount of sleep that people get does not seem to affect relationship status. So it takes you longer to fall asleep, but once you do, you tend to sleep just about as long. Robert, hello, good to see you. All right, let's talk about high intensity interval training. Again, if you wanna leave what type of exercise you do in the chat, I would love to see it. I personally, and people that know me will tell you this, I lift weights. That's what I do probably five, maybe six days a week. I love it. You know, people talk about running and the runner's high, and I used to run, and I remember the runner's high, but I don't feel that anything helps me personally. This is not what everybody else should do, but for me personally, lifting weights is what burns stress and sort of, if I don't lift weights for two or three days, I get edgy and just don't feel right. Uh, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, I wasn't able to lift weights for a few days. I think it was three straight days because I was traveling and the gym, the, the hotel gym wasn't open because of COVID, which is kind of crazy, but it, I, I could definitely see the difference. So I like to lift weights. I do cardio, but not nearly as much as I should. I don't do nearly enough abs, not nearly enough flexibility, and I'm working to add those back in. Now, when I do cardio, I tend to prefer high intensity interval training over what I call steady state cardio. And if you're wondering what that means, modern intensity continuous training, you've seen these if you go to the gym, right? These are the people on the elliptical doing 30 or 45 minutes or 60 minutes on the elliptical or on the bike and maybe they're watching something on the screen in front of them like a real housewives show or something like that. They're not working all that hard. Sometimes they're working hard, but usually not. And they're just going at a steady state trying to do their exercise. And I'm not opposed, anything that makes you exercise, I'm all for. But that has been the way people got cardio, at least in gyms, for long, long periods of time. But over the last four or five years, there's been this movement for more, maybe seven or eight years, high intensity interval training. And, and one of the, the reasons is, I mean, we've known for decades exercise is good, but as far as physicians, in my case, and, and all of us here in the health profession, it's been very, very hard to get people to exercise. We want you to get 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise, which is typically 30 minute sessions for five days a week, or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise, which you can break up into shorter periods of time more often, whatever it is. The most common reason people give for not exercising, and this to me is BS, is lack of time. I, I don't believe that at all. I, I get that we're all busy, but to me this is a matter of you don't find the time, you make the time. And if exercise is important to you, you will find a way to work it in your schedule. I, I don't think lack of time is a real answer. It's an excuse in my mind. But having said that, that's where potentially high intensity interval training comes in because you can get, in theory, the same benefit. We're gonna talk about whether it gives you the same benefit or not, but can you get that with much less time, much less volume. And again, not just uh, weight loss and body fat, but you know, glucose metabolism, and then aerobic fitness and endurance and things like that. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Now, HIIT training can be all over the map. This can be, you know, basically it's sprint, recovery, sprint, sprint, recovery, sprint, recovery, and it can be different numbers of intervals. There's all sorts of different ways to do it. it. can be The sprints can be as little as three or seven seconds. I've seen literally as, as short as six. I don't know that I'd ever go three, but people say you can do it in as little th as three. And then the recovery periods can be 30 seconds, 60 seconds, two to four minutes. One of the protocols, and you've heard it, me mention it on this show before, uh, it was made famous in a book four or five years ago maybe, the one minute workout, Martin Gabala, who's a researcher up in Canada, uh, in uh, British Columbia, I think, Vancouver maybe, uh, and he talked, I mean, it was, the book was about the benefits of high intensity, high intensity interval training, but the one minute workout specifically was this 10 minute uh, workout where it had three 20 second all out sprints and it was roughly two plus minute recovery intervals, but I mean 20 seconds all out. I mean, you if you're doing it on a stationary bike, people in the gym around you, because I did this several times, they start to stare. I mean, you're really moving and it makes a lot of noise and it looks really crazy. It actually kicks your butt. Try that. Uh, it, but anyway, 
read the book. It's a really interesting book, but try that workout uh, if you want. Uh, but there's all different ways to do HIIT training. We're going to talk about, you can do it as different modalities too. You can do it running, you can do it stationary bike, you can do it rowing, you can do it. There's body weight ways to do it. Uh, a lot of those on-demand uh, work out from home beach body programs are essentially high intensity interval training. So there's a lot of ways to do it. What you care about is which is better. And there've been a number of studies. This is sort of the take home point and then I'm going to break it down individually. That that basically show high intensity interval training gives you about the same or at least maybe even a little bit better depending on the metrics you're looking at compared to what we call modern intensity continuous training. Better in terms of muscle and skeletal muscle uh, adaptations, cardiovascular fitness, vascular function, body fat, things like that. Uh, or it's again about the same. So a little bit better or about the same, but again with much less time, much less volume of training. So let's break that down a little bit comparing HIIT training and what I, again, steady state cardio and how they compare. I want to start with sort of the metabolic things, weight loss, fat loss, glucose, things like that, and then we'll move on to endurance and aerobic fitness. So there was one study that looked at 15 weeks of training, high intensity interval training, steady state cardio, or the intense uh, continuous training, moderate intensity. As far as looking at body fat and losing fat-free mass, high intensity interval training did much better over 15 weeks than the continuous training group. So from that sense, that's pretty good. There was a real good study done, what is this now, 2018, so four years ago, that looked at, again, high intensity interval training, moderate intensity continuous exercise, looking specifically at overweight or obese adults. It was several hundred, like 250. And they had to do either of those trainings three times a week. And they got to choose which group they were gonna be. It was not randomized. You got to either choose the HIIT training, choose the steady state. 42% chose the HIIT training. They followed them for 12 months. They had to do it three times a week for 12 months. No real difference after 12 months in things like visceral fat. Now, the HIIT training did, they did have higher rates of enjoyment of the exercise. But one of the things and that they found is the per people that made it to 12 months in the HIT session it started. They about 60% of them were doing it um, at least uh, twice a week, but preferably three times a week. But by 12 months, only 20% were still doing it. So about the same results in terms of metabolic changes, weight loss, things like that. But for the ones that were able to stick with high intensity interval training, they had significant weight loss and fat loss. So one of the things that I always say is the best type of exercise is the type you'll, act, you'll actually do. If you like HIIT training and stick with it, I think you're going to have really good success rates. But for people that are overweight, don't really exercise, it may be a, a really hard way to get started. There was another a meta-analysis that looks at kind of all the current studies that are out there looking at body composition. Again, this is lean muscle mass, this is body fat, and both programs, high intensity interval training and the steady state continuous training, both had about equal reductions in body fat and waist circumference. No real significant difference, but again, the HIIT training took a lot less time. In this study, it was about 40% less time to get the same results. Now, what was interesting in that study, when they compared the type of exercise, running had much better effects in terms of losing body fat, whether it was continuous running, steady state, or high intensity interval. Running had all those benefits and loss of body fat. Cycling, whether it was continuous cycling, steady state, or high intensity interval training on a stationary bike, did not have those effects. So that's kind of interesting to me because if you kind of go to these sites, they talk about high intensity interval training. Cycling and stationary bikes are one of the ways, that's the whole purpose of spin classes. And so that's kind of an interesting study. Yes, you can do high intensity interval training running. It's called sprints and you run sprints and you take a break or you run fast and then run slower and then run fast again. There's lots of ways to do it. But running in that study at least might be a little bit better. And then last one I want to talk about, about uh, high intensity interval training and steady state cardio as far as metabolic things looked at type two diabetics. HIIT training there was much better for reducing fasting glucose. So at least for type two diabetics, and that's a huge percentage of the population in this country with obesity high, as high as it is, that it might be better for blood glucose, maintenance, insulin sensitivity, things like that. And then looking at heart rate variability, which I'm gonna tell you I am not 
the most astute about heart rate variability. I know it's a key marker. My Aura Ring, I get data about heart rate variability every morning when I sync my data. I'm still learning a lot about it. As I, as I study for my, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get a third board certification in uh, anti-aging and regenerative medicine. Right now, I'm actually doing the cardiovascular section, so maybe I'll understand this better. But as far as heart rate variability goes, I know you don't care about any of that, but it looks like HIT training might be better for heart rate variability. So in terms of improving your heart autoregulation, that might be a little bit better. All right, let's last, let's talk about fitness because that's what a lot of people, including me, care about. We're gonna talk about VO2 max, which is a very, very good indicator of your aerobic fitness or what we call cardiovascular fitness. There was a randomized control study, 58 middle-aged adults with type two diabetes that did either the high intensity interval training or the moderate intensity continuous training four times a week for eight weeks about the same results. Little bit higher improvement in the HIT sessions compared to the moderate intensity was 8% compared to 10%. Maximal exercise tolerance went up a little bit more in the HIT training compared to the moderate intensity, but they worked about the same. So that gets back to if your goal is fitness, it's whichever one you'll really do. Now, there was one looking at completely sedentary, overweight or obese people randomly assigned to one of the two groups, again, looking at VO2 max, same type of thing. Both groups had about the same improvements in VO2 max, about the same improvements in insulin sensitivity, reduction in cholesterol levels, decreased body fat, and fitness. In fact, it was a little bit better in the continuous training than in the HIT training, but both were thought to be good. That's kind of the bottom line. But again, with the high intensity interval training, you get to do it in last time. And then the last one, and, and about that, we're gonna talk the last one about young athletes and endurance and things like that. I'm not convinced it has to be either or. I'm a big fan of doing a little bit of both. But again, last thing, when we're talking about young athletes, which is better? Well, there was a study four years ago looking at trying to improve endurance, trying to improve anaerobic fitness. This is going all out and that's what generates the lactate and all that. High intensity interval training, much better at improving VO2 max, oxygen consumption, running speed, overall sprint performance. So if you're an athlete, if you compete, even if you're an adult, working some HIIT training in there might help with that aerobic fitness as well as anaerobic performance, you might perform better. Don't You don't have to be young, this applies to everybody. So from an athlete standpoint, I might add in the high intensity interval training. Now. So what I'm gonna tell you, what I take home from all this is they're both good for you. One's not necessarily better for others. It depends on a little bit on what you're trying to achieve. I'm a big fan of some days you do longer steady state cardio, some days you do very short but all out spurts of exercise with recovery intervals, the high intensity interval training. But again, I'm gonna say this, not just today, but in all of these shows when we talk about exercise, the best type of exercise is the type you'll, ex you'll actually do. Go out there and try it. Go to a gym and do, this, do it on a stationary bike. Go to a track and do it on a track or just running around your neighborhood, alternating fast and slow and see how you like it. The upside, I think, for the high intensity interval training that these studies don't account for, and I haven't actually seen studied, would be the effect on injury rates. Is Are those 60 minute runs or long, long bike rides causing a little bit more wear and tear than the shorter high intensity sessions? I don't really know. So that, that's kind of what I think about all this. I would love, whether it's today or you can email me, however you think, I'd love to know what you think as it pertains to high intensity interval training. I know most of my friends have sort of switched to more high intensity interval training than the steady state cardio. That's sort of come out of fashion, uh, but it's not for everybody. If you wanna read the studies I talked about, because some people are interested in that, they should be in the description below this video. All right, if you like information like this, optimal health, optimal wellness. If you like information on healing from recovery, healing and recovery, I should say, from sports and exercise injuries, however it is, so you can feel and perform your best, subscribe to this channel. Click the bell to be notified 
when I'm on live. Uh, YouTube.com forward slash Dr. David Geyer is where I sometimes do spontaneous live streams, so definitely check that out. If you do want to come see me, and I literally just got done emailing somebody that wants to come from California to see me in Charleston, South Carolina, I would love that. I, right now, we're not doing telemedicine because I don't have medical licenses anywhere but North and South Carolina, but I would love to see you. I'm a double board certified orthopedic surgeon, so I can talk to you about the sports and exercise injury part. I've done thousands of those surgeries, but I can also talk to you about some of the less conventional treatments, not just cortisone shots and physical therapy and surgery. So if you'd like more information on that, the link to my website and the contact information should be below this video. Also, next week, or later this week, we're going to talk about visceral fat and the dangers of visceral fat, uh, why it's just really, really bad for your overall health. We're going to talk about that. Next week, we're going to talk about some of the new anti-aging and new sort of buzz topics out there. We're going to talk about NAD and its role in aging. We're going to talk about some supplements that might help prevent or treat osteoarthritis, not so much the cortisone shots and the surgery. We're going to talk about things, nutritional supplements you can take every day. Soon thereafter, we're going to talk about this may be the following week or sometime in there. We're going to talk about Mod SC, the peptide that's getting all kinds of attention. It's a mitochondrial peptide, and it's big. It's being nicknamed the uh, exercise in a bottle peptide, basically replacing the need for exercise. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Very, very exciting, and I might share some personal experience uh, that I might know about with that. So lots of good topics coming up. Friday, I will be here for Ask Dr. Geyer Live at noon, as I will be every Friday, 12 p.m. Eastern Time. If you have a bone or joint injury question and you want to ask that, you'll just leave it in the chat and I'll answer it as I go. That's all I've got for you today. I'm headed to the office here, so I'm going to let you go. Really, really appreciate you joining. Make sure to subscribe to Better Than Ever Live wherever you get your podcasts if you can't be here live on a regular basis, and I will see you on 